piercing. One. A small living creature asleep in its crib, like a laboratory animal in a cage, thought Kawashima Masayuki. He used the palm of his hand to shade the pen light so that it illuminated only the baby's form, leaving the rest of the bedroom in darkness. Leaning in closer, he silently mouthed the words, fast asleep. As Yoko's pregnancy had progressed, and the fact that he was actually going to be a father began to sink in, he'd worried that the baby might have difficulty sleeping. Kawashima had suffered from insomnia since elementary school, and, after all, his blood would run in this child's veins. He'd heard it was normal for newborns to sleep virtually around the clock. In fact, he seemed to recall some child-rearing expert describing sleep as an infant's job. What could be more tragic, then, than a baby insomniac? He turned softly to check on Yoko in the double bed behind him. Her regular breathing assured him she was still asleep. Kawashima had been doing this every night lately, standing there gazing down at the baby while his wife slept. Ten nights in a row now, to be exact. It was well after midnight, and since Yoko rose early each morning to prepare for work, she wasn't likely to awaken. A wholesome and healthy 29-year-old cooking expert, Yoko was a stranger to things like insomnia. She'd quit her job with a major manufacturer of baked goods when they married, and begun giving lessons to people from the neighbourhood, right here in their one-bedroom apartment. Yoko's bread and pastry classes proved astonishingly popular, and now she had dozens of students, from housewives and middle school girls to elderly widowers and even middle-aged men. She taught classes almost every day, taking only two fixed holidays a month, and the entire apartment, including this bedroom, was permeated with the buttery smell that, for Kawashima, had come to symbolize happiness. Little Ri, the name suggested by Yoko's mother, was now four months old, and Yoko somehow managed to look after her and still maintain a full teaching schedule. Of course, it didn't hurt that most of her students were female, and always eager to help out with the baby. He switched off the pen light for a moment and examined the pale moonbeam that sliced through a gap behind the curtains. The narrow strip of light reached to the middle of the crib, slashing across the baby's pink blanket and the pocket of Kawashima's corduroy slacks. As a little boy, he'd often sat in his room, with the moon his only source of light, drawing pictures of a long, narrow road that vanished in the distance. Remembering those times, and taking care not to prick his finger, he lifted the ice pick from his pocket. He closed his right hand around the handle and gently drew back the baby's blanket with his left. This exposed her neck and upper chest, whiter and softer even than the bread Yoko baked. He switched the pen light back on and shone it upon her cheeks and neck. It seemed to him that the fragrance of fresh bread grew suddenly more pronounced, mixed with another scent he didn't recognize. He wasn't aware of the beads of perspiration on his forehead and temples until he saw one drip onto the baby's blanket. The panel heater against the wall had warmed the room somewhat, but it was far from hot in here. The tip of the ice pick was quivering slightly. Another bead rolled down Kawashima's saturated eyebrow and into the corner of his eye. That's sickening, he thought, and squeezed his eyes shut. Didn't even know I was sweating. Couldn't even feel it. Like it isn't me the sweat's pouring down, but a wax figure of me, or some stranger who looks just like me. Damn. As he opened his eyes, he found that his senses of sight and sound and smell were getting entangled with one another. And now came a snapping, crackling sensation and a pungent whiff of something organic burning yarn or fingernails, something like that. He moaned beneath his breath. Not again. It always started with the sweating, followed by the smell of charred tissue, then a sudden sense of utter exhaustion, and finally that indescribable pain, 
as if the particles of air were turning to needles and piercing him all over, a prickling pain that spread like goosebumps over his skin until he wanted to scream. Sometimes a white mist clouded his vision, and he could actually see the air particles turning into needles. Calm down, he told himself. Relax. You're all right. You've already made up your mind. You'll never stab her. Everything's going to be all right. Gripping the ice pick lightly to minimize trembling, he placed the point of it next to the baby's cheek. Every time he studied this instrument, with its slender, gleaming steel rod that tapered down to such needle-like sharpness, he wondered why it was necessary to have things like this in the world. If it were truly only for chopping ice, you'd think a completely different design might do. The people who produce and sell things like this don't understand, he thought. They don't realize that some of us break out in a cold sweat at just a glimpse of that shiny, pointed tip. The baby's lips moved almost imperceptibly, lips so small they didn't even look like lips, more like larvae or a chrysalis that might unfold into an insect with beautiful wings. Vanishingly tiny red blood vessels colored the skin of her cheeks beneath the peach fuzz. Kawashima stroked the surface of that fine layer of fuzz, first with a fingertip and then with the tip of the instrument. It really is all right. I'm not going to stab the baby. Just as he was thinking this, Yoko's soft voice shattered the silence. What are you doing? His entire body clenched, and the tip of the ice pick grazed the baby's cheek. He switched off the pen light and slowly exhaled. As he turned to face his wife, he palmed the ice pick and slipped it handle first into his pocket. She was sitting halfway up in bed, her weight on one elbow. Did I wake you? Sorry. He tiptoed to her side and leaned over to kiss her cheek. What time is it? She said. A little past one. You were looking at Re? Yeah, I didn't mean to wake you. You're tired. Go back to sleep. Are you still working? Most of the layout is finished. I just have to choose the slides. It'll make the presentation a lot easier. Yoko lay back down and was asleep again before he'd even finished whispering this. Thank goodness. It would have been bad if she'd turned on the light to go to the toilet or get a drink of water. She'd have seen he was sweating, and she might have noticed the tip of the ice pick protruding from his pocket. Two. Kawashima put the ice pick away in a kitchen drawer, washed his face in the bathroom sink, and walked into the living room. He sat at his desk and waited in vain for his heartbeat to slow down. His throat was parched with tension, and he thought about having a drink, but immediately rejected the idea. He didn't allow himself alcohol at times like this, because he knew he'd just end up tossing back belts of something strong, a procedure that would help him relax, only very briefly, after which he'd lose all control. He'd drink until he blacked out and remember virtually nothing the following day. He looked around the room, trying to breathe deeply and deliberately. They still called it the living room, but had transformed it into a workspace for both of them. There were no sofas or easy chairs, but a heavy L-shaped table of unfinished wood dominated more than half of the floor area. This monster, imported from Sweden, and big enough to accommodate eight or ten dough-needing students at once, was Yoko's most prized possession. It had been Kawashima's wedding present to her, and he'd cleaned out his bank account to pay for it. He still felt the same about Yoko as he had back then. He couldn't believe he'd managed to meet, fall in love with, and actually marry a woman like this. He and she were the same age. They'd met six years ago, in early summer, at an art gallery in Ginza. 
It was the opening of an exhibition of works by a Russian-born French artist named Nicolas de Stael, a painter of sombre abstracts. He wasn't well known in Japan, and although it was Saturday afternoon, the two of them were the only visitors. Yoko was the first to speak. Are you an artist? she said. Kawashima was carrying a sketchbook under his arm. I do some drawing, yes, he told her. She was wearing glasses with cream-coloured frames, and they looked good on her, but he couldn't help thinking she'd be even prettier without them. They left the gallery together and went to a coffee shop with glass walls overlooking the Ginza crossing. He ordered a double espresso, and she the shop's famous cheesecake, and a cup of apple tea. The sun of early summer slanted gently through the blinds, and on each table was a glass bud vase with a single orchid. Yoko smelled good. Mixed with her perfume, Kawashima thought he detected another fragrance, though he didn't yet recognize it as the smell of freshly baked bread. He only knew he found it pleasant, presumably because he really liked this person and felt so relaxed around her. Conversely, whenever he was stressed out or stuck in the company of someone he didn't care for, even ambient smells tended to strike him as repulsive. Yoko ate her cheesecake slowly as she poured over the pages of his sketchbook. At one point, a tiny crumb fell on one of the drawings, and she very carefully removed it with the corner of her napkin. Something about the way she did that made him very happy. They began meeting about once a week to have dinner, or visit a museum, or see a movie together. Kawashima was working for a graphic design firm and drawing in his spare time. His drawings were all of narrow roads in the moonlight. No other subjects had ever interested him. But one day near the end of summer, he drew from memory a pencil sketch of Yoko's face. When he presented the sketch to her on their next date, she invited him to her apartment for the first time. And there she made a halting and clearly painful confession. Until about a year before, she'd been dating an older man from her company. And on the day they broke up, she'd swallowed a handful of sleeping pills and been rushed to hospital. What did he think of a woman who'd do something like that? Kawashima said he didn't think it was any big deal, and he meant it. Who hasn't wanted to die at one time or another, he said. Not long afterwards, they moved in together. They'd been sharing a place for about six months when, late on a freezing winter's night, Kawashima awoke and leapt out of bed drenched in a sweat that had soaked all the way through the covers. Startled from sleep, Yoko frantically asked what was wrong, but all he would say was that he needed to take a little walk. He threw on some clothes and left the apartment. When he returned, some two hours later, he told her something he'd never told anyone before. I get like that sometimes, he said. It's happened to me ever since I was a little kid, but I never had a name for it until I got older and found it in a psychology book. They call it Pavor Nocturnus, Night Terrors. It was even worse when I was little. I'd wake up in a panic and jump out of bed like I did tonight, only I'd be screaming at the top of my lungs. Sometimes I'd run in circles around the room for, I don't know, two or three minutes. Afterwards, I could never remember anything only that something had terrified me so badly that I, I didn't know who I was and couldn't even recognize the people around me. It was like they'd melted into my dream, become characters in this nightmare. It was so scary. So scary. Now that I'm grown up, it's not quite as bad. I mean, I don't forget who I am anymore, and like tonight, I knew that was you speaking to me, asking me what was wrong. So why, Yoko asked, did you dash out all alone? Why didn't you let me hold you? Kawashima shook his head. I've just always thought it best, when I lose control like that, not to be around anybody else. Better to go somewhere by myself and walk it off, do some deep breathing to calm myself down. He decided, then and there, to tell Yoko everything he'd been keeping secret for so long, with the single exception of the time, at 19, that he'd stabbed a certain woman 
with a nice pig. He didn't want to get into that, partly because the event was so vague and uncertain in his memory, and partly because he feared it might scare her away. He didn't want to lose her. I think what's behind them, behind the night terrors, is that after my father died, when I was four, my mother started hitting me. She beat the hell out of me. I don't remember my father at all, except for this vague sense that he used to take us out for drives in a car. And I know he had one, for a while at least, because my mother always used to describe him as the sort of fool who'd put a down payment on a car he couldn't afford. I haven't seen my mother for years, but the last time we met at my high school graduation, she said she treated me the way she did because I reminded her of him, meaning my father, the fool. I was afraid of the beatings, because they really hurt. But I also just assumed she must be doing it because I was such a bad kid. The weird thing is, it's something you can learn to endure, that kind of abuse. You just tell yourself it's not really you who's getting beaten. If you concentrate really hard, you can actually get to a place where it doesn't hurt anymore. A lot of times she beat me with no warning, and that was especially scary. So I used to try to stay prepared all the time. I keep reminding myself, mother's going to hit me, mother's going to hit me. What bothered me most, though, was that I was the only one she hit. She never laid a finger on my little brother. As you know, we lived in this little town in the sticks, and the nearest city of any size was Odawara. In Odawara, they had a department store with a playland for little kids on the roof level. The three of us went there together a few times, but when I was about five or six, my mother started locking me in the house and taking only my little brother. One time I climbed out the window and ran down the road chasing after them, and she dragged me back to the house and tied me to the water pipes in the bathroom. I remember that so clearly, like it was yesterday. I fell asleep right there on the tile floor, and when I woke up it was dark outside, and all I could see was that empty, narrow little road outside the window. Not long after that, a middle school teacher of mine got me placed in a home for abused kids. And that's when I started drawing. Right from the beginning, I drew nothing but pictures of narrow roads at night. Kawashima bowed his head. I've never told anyone about this before, he said. And Yoko took his hand and squeezed it. They were married a year and eight months after meeting in Ginza. Yoko told her parents that in accordance with the values she and her fiancé shared, she didn't want a wedding ceremony. And they reluctantly agreed. But in fact, it wasn't really about values. She knew Kawashima hadn't forgiven his mother and younger brother and didn't want to put him in an awkward position. I was in the home for a little over two years, he told her. And then I went to live with my grandmother on my father's side. At my high school graduation, I don't know why, but my mother apologized to me. It was a pretty self-serving apology, but still, it was an apology. Then at the end, she said, You forgive me, don't you? You forgive your mother? I nodded without even thinking. But then something in me snapped, and I slapped her face, hard. It was the only time I ever hit her. Kawashima hadn't opposed Yoko's decision to quit her job. He'd made up his mind right from the beginning to support her in anything she chose to do. Nor did he express any reservations when she said she wanted to have a baby. The other guys in the office often teased him about how much he'd changed since his marriage, how much more cheerful he was. What exactly is Yoko-chan putting in that bread of hers? That sort of thing. He himself wasn't really sure if he'd changed or not, but ever since he'd met Yoko, and especially since the day they'd decided, at her suggestion, to marry, his bouts of self-loathing had all but ceased. Not once had he been overwhelmed by the old panic and terror, not even when Ri was born, and he first held her in his arms. Not, in fact until ten nights ago. 
The mental and emotional torment of the old cycle of anxiety, unable to bear being alone, wanting someone always near, but growing anxious when someone does get close, fearing that if they get any closer there's no telling what might happen, until the fear itself becomes unbearable and solitude seems the only solution, had seemed to be fast becoming a thing of the past. Until ten nights ago, Kawashima muttered to himself, flicking the switch on the light box atop his desk. On its glass lid, he arranged several of the 35 millimeter slides he'd taken from the company archives. They were photos he was considering for a poster advertising the Yokohama Jazz Festival, though none of them had anything to do with jazz. Choosing graphics that had no direct connection to the product was something of a speciality of his. When the first indoor ski slopes were about to open in Kaishu, his presentation, with copy that read, There's a first time for everything, splashed across a photo of a little Caucasian boy and girl kissing, had won out over all the other agencies and made him a minor hero at the office. The photos he'd assembled for the jazz festival were black and whites of fashion models from the 1940s, The girls were all healthy specimens with generous smiles, lying on sandy beaches or about to dive into pools, or strolling beneath parasols, or drinking cocktails on a terrace. But it was impossible to care about any of this right now. Ten nights ago. He was in the bathtub with the baby, having just finished washing her. He handed her over to Yoko, who was waiting with a fluffy bath towel, and then he leaned back in the tub, leaving the pebbled glass shower door partially open. Yoko was murmuring to the baby as she dried her, and he was aware of himself smiling at them. And then, with no prelude or warning, a thought came percolating up into his brain, and he felt the muscles of his cheeks twitch and freeze. I wouldn't ever stab that baby with an ice pick, would I? For a moment, he wasn't certain who was sitting there in that steam-filled tub. Yoko opened the bathroom door to leave, then looked back and said something to him, but it wasn't registering. Masayuki? Masayuki, what's wrong? What's the matter? She called to him several times before he snapped out of it. Oh, still there? Guess I was daydreaming, he said. And by the time his eyes were refocused on her and the baby, his skin, in spite of the very warm water, had turned to goose flesh. The sharp, gleaming point of an ice pick. From that moment on, he couldn't get the image out of his head. You wouldn't do something like that. You would never stab the baby. He told himself hundreds of times, but the voice inside him never stopped replying. I just might. And each night from then on, he'd found himself unable to go to bed until he stood over the crib, ice pick in hand, to confirm to himself that it was all right. He wasn't going to stab her. Kawashima turned off the light box. He got his leather jacket from the closet, put it on over his sweater, and headed for the door. Three. Their apartment was on the second floor of a four-story building. He closed the door noiselessly behind him, checked several times to make sure it was locked, and made his way down the stairs. There was no guard or watchman in the lobby. To enter through the glass doors, you had to either punch in a code or have someone buzz you in over the intercom. To exit, of course, you simply touched the sensor plate marked open, but the landlord had stressed the importance of taking precautions to prevent strangers slipping inside as you walked out. Not long before, someone, apparently disguised as a delivery man, had burgled one of the apartments. Kids had been known to spray paint graffiti on the lobby walls, and some jerk had once melted the intercom's plastic number pad with a lighter. Outside, Kawashima zipped up his jacket and raised its fluff-lined collar, reflecting that he rather enjoyed the cold. In heated rooms, he often felt the outlines of his body, the border between him and the external world. 
grow disturbingly fuzzy. Yoko had awakened, but hadn't seemed to notice anything, and for the moment, standing on the empty street of their neighborhood in Kokobunji, away from the room with the sleeping baby, he felt a certain degree of relief. It's just my neurosis, he reasoned with himself. I just get freaked out imagining I might stab the baby. It's not as if I actually want to stab her. Who doesn't imagine things that make them anxious? Maybe nothing this extreme, but like having to give a speech at a wedding, for example. A lot of people are terrified of screwing up and being ridiculed or laughed at. Or you can accidentally make eye contact with some psycho on the train and think, what if he gets off behind me and follows me home? Thanks to the imagination, there's no end to things in this world that can trigger anxiety. Normally, of course, you can free yourself from fears like that just by facing them or telling someone about them. Normally. On the ground floor of the building next door was a video shop. At the end of a long day, after dinner and a bath, Yoko liked to sit with a glass of wine or beer and watch a movie. One night, in the last month of her pregnancy, the two of them had watched Basic Instinct together. Kawashima wanted to flee the room as soon as he saw the first scene, which depicted a murder by Ice Pick. But Yoko said, I'm not sure this is good for the baby, but it's an interesting story, isn't it? It was that attitude of hers, that detached amusement, that helped him calm down and sit all the way through the film. Often during the past ten days, he'd wondered why his fear was of stabbing only the baby and not Yoko. Remembering the time they'd watched Basic Instinct together gave him the answer. Because Yoko could talk to him. Talking with someone helped neutralize the power of the imagination. And Yoko had a delicate but skillful way of dealing with the wounds he carried inside. Her attitude was neither insensitive nor indulgent. Neither. Why don't you just get over it? Nor, oh, you poor thing. She never went out of her way to avoid the subject, and when it came up, her comments were always both clear-eyed and supportive. When you have a chronic illness, she'd tell him, getting frustrated or impatient with it just makes things worse, right? Isn't that what they say? That you have to live in harmony with an illness? To think of it as an old friend? Or... Why is it that when people grow up, they totally forget how vulnerable and helpless they were as children? Or, until Re was born, I never knew how stressful having children can be. I'm sure even your mother must wonder what she could have been thinking back then. The way she'd say these things never failed to soothe and comfort him. The first scene of basic instinct was a jolt to his system. But by the time the ice pick reappeared later in the film, he was thoroughly enjoying the story. In the next building past the video shop was a bookstore. Something moved in the gap between the two buildings, and he stopped to see what it was. The gap, just wide enough for a grown man to walk through, dead-ended at another building. It was very dark in there, but he was sure he'd seen two or three small figures moving small enough that they had to be children no more than nine or ten years old. They weren't moving now, probably because Kawashima had stopped and was looking their way, but he wasn't about to call out to them or step over and peer into the gap. He knew that even a ten-year-old child could be dangerous. Just before walking on, he spotted a little red point of light. It might have been a burning cigarette, except for the fact that he neither saw nor smelled spoke. The eye of a small animal, maybe, reflecting the streetlight. Between the two buildings, he remembered, were garbage cans and waste water puddled around a drain. The kids were probably killing rats for kicks in that narrow darkness. Back in the home for at-risk children, Kawashima had had a friend his age named Takuchan. At some point, the home acquired a pair of pet rabbits, and one of their offspring was placed in Takuchan's care. Takuchan loved his little pet more than anything, and even insisted on sleeping with it in his arms. But one day, right before Kawashima's eyes, and for no apparent reason, he grabbed the animal by its still undeveloped ears 
stood up and slammed it down against the concrete floor. It made a sound like delicate porcelain breaking, but the bunny wasn't dead and tried to crawl away with spastic movements like a wind-up toy winding down. Taku-chan, wearing the same dull expression he'd often worn when stroking his pet's soft fur, stomped several times on its head with the heel of his shoe, then, ignoring its crushed, lifeless body, he went off to get another one to take its place. Kawashima and Taku-chan sometimes drew pictures together, and Taku-chan's were always the same. He'd smear the whole sheet of paper with black or dark blue or purple, and in the middle he'd paint a naked little boy whose body was pierced from head to foot with arrows, dozens of them protruding in every direction, like quills. Who's that? a counsellor once asked him, and Taku-chan said, Me. The counsellor said, Well, if it wasn't you, Taku-chan, who would it be? If it's not me, said Taku-chan, I don't care who it is. Kawashima decided he might as well head for the all-night convenience store down the street. He was walking slowly to calm himself, but his heartbeat still wasn't back to normal. The cold seeped up through the soles of his shoes, and each exhalation was a small white cloud, a visible reminder of how fast and irregular his breathing was. Across the street was an apartment building of reinforced concrete, and at the window of a corner room on the third floor, a woman with short hair was smoking a cigarette. She used her sleeve to wipe a circular clear spot on the misty glass and look down at the street. That building, Kawashima recalled, consisted entirely of studio apartments for single women. The light was behind her and he couldn't see her face, but judging by her hairstyle and the way she smoked the cigarette, he could tell she was no longer young. Late thirties, maybe. The image of a hand with dry skin and wrinkles and prominent veins formed in his mind. A woman in her late thirties, holding a thin black menthol cigarette in a hand like an autumn leaf. He'd met her when she was seventeen and lived with her for nearly two years. She was nineteen years older, and they were often mistaken for mother and son. Whenever this happened, the woman would force a smile and maintain a veneer of cool indifference. But afterwards, when she and Kawashima were alone, she'd rail bitterly against the person who'd committed the faux pas, sometimes for hours at a time. She was a stripper working in Gotanda when he met her, though in the two years they were together she must have changed clubs a dozen times. The woman frequently brought men she'd met at a strip club back to the apartment and fooled around with them right in front of Kawashima. If they asked, She'd tell them in a drunken mumble that he was her little brother. And yet invariably, after the men left, she'd go ballistic on Kawashima, attacking him with her fists and shrieking, If you really loved me, you wouldn't just sit there and let another man make me do those things. You'd beat the hell out of him or kill him. Eventually, he did rough some of them up, after which she'd start pounding him anyway, screaming that he was going to make her lose her job. The hysteria wouldn't stop until she ran completely out of steam and passed out. What a hateful bitch, Kawashima used to think. How does a person ever get to be this despicable? He was sure he was the only one in the world who could ever care about her, which was why he believed she would never leave him. The night he stabbed her with an ice pick had always been somewhat unclear in his memory. He'd returned to the apartment late that night after sniffing thinner with a friend, so he wasn't exactly in a lucid state of mind to begin with. A kerosene space heater burned in the middle of the room, and a pot of water sat simmering on top of it. The woman had just got back from work and was sitting before the mirror, removing her makeup. He tried to hug her from behind, and she wouldn't let him. All she said was, Don't touch me. But her manner was so cold and harsh that it terrified him, he put his arms around her again, and again she spurned him, prizing his fingers loose this time and shaking him off. Stop breathing your fucking thinner fumes on me, she snarled. Kawashima was devastated. All he could think was, I need to be punished. She's mad at me. She's mad at me, but she won't hit me, so I've got to punish myself. If I don't, she might leave. 
He walked to the heater and shoved his right hand into the pot of boiling water. When he lifted the red, scalded hand from the pot to show her, the woman called him a moron and walked into the bathroom, peeling off her clothing as she went. He was convinced that after her shower she'd leave the apartment and wouldn't come back. How long would he have to sit there, scared half to death, waiting for her return? He mustn't let her go. He was racking his brain, thinking he had to do something before she finished showering, when suddenly there was a crackling of little explosions where his senses of sight and smell and hearing collided. Something like the odour of a burning yarn or scorched fingernails filled his nostrils, and the next thing he knew, he'd flung open the shower curtain, and the tip of the ice pick in his hand was soundlessly piercing her stomach. The ice pick met no more resistance than would a safety pin sinking into a sponge. It slid effortlessly into her sagging white belly, and when he pulled it out he saw thick, dark red blood ooze from the round little hole it had made. The ice pick may have dropped from his scalded hand then, but his memory was pretty much a blank from this point on. He couldn't even remember if the police had shown up or not. Hundreds of times, in dreams, he'd seen the ice pick hit the tile of the bathroom floor and roll under the tub. In the dreams, he'd get down on his elbows and knees and reach for it, only to burn his hand again on the pilot light for the water heater. Sometimes he'd wake up from this nightmare, convinced that his right hand really was on fire. If the cops had come, the woman must not have told them the truth, because Kawashima was never taken in for questioning. Nor did she ever mention the incident to him, even after coming home from the hospital. He moved out without being asked. Although he returned to the apartment a number of times in the weeks that followed, the woman always refused to see him, and eventually she moved away. Kawashima believed the ice pick was probably still in that apartment, lying underneath the tub, and he somehow felt that the day would come when he'd go back there to see it. He'd reached the door to the convenience store when he noticed something curious. His heart rate had returned to normal. Wondering if this was somehow related to his reminiscences about the stripper, he stepped inside the store, where he was enveloped by the warm air, and felt the outlines of his body begin to blur. He walked to the stack of shopping baskets, and had just grabbed one when the clerk behind the counter to his right, silent till now, shouted, Iras Haimase, to the customers entering behind him, a young couple huddling together and gasping from the cold. The couple drifted off towards the magazine racks, and the clerk turned his gaze from them back to the register. That was all but it was enough to trigger in Kawashima the familiar but dreadful sensation that he himself wasn't really there. Not as if he were dead or a ghost or spirit or something, but as if he'd separated from his own body and was waiting a short distance away. As a boy, he'd escaped the pain and terror of his mother's beatings by concentrating on the thought that the one who was being hit wasn't really him, he consistently, methodically, trained himself to think that way. His mother, enraged at the child who wouldn't cry or even cry out, only hit him all the harder. But the more she hit him, the more he concentrated on telling himself that it wasn't him she was hitting, until he actually succeeded in separating himself from the pain. Fearing, however, that if he pushed himself too far away, he might not be able to find his way back, he made himself promise to wait nearby and return as soon as circumstances permitted. What I'm feeling now, he told himself, is just a remnant of those times, just an echo from the past. He looked up at the packages of disposable diapers on the top shelf against the far wall, and remembered Yoko saying that no matter how many diapers she bought, it never seemed to be enough. He decided to buy some, and it was at that moment that he was suddenly convinced that he really had separated, and was waiting for himself there among the diapers. Damn, he muttered, and tried to force a wry smile, but failed as fear squeezed his heart. What the hell's going on? He couldn't actually see his other self standing before the shelves two or three paces ahead of him now, holding a package of disposable diapers. 
This other self pointed to the picture of a baby on the package and grinned at Kawashima, then beckoned to him. Come here. There's something really important I need to tell you. Kawashima moved towards the shelves as if being reeled in. Think about it, the other said. Why do you really think you were able to watch Basic Instinct so calmly? That's what you were wondering on the way here, right? You remembered Taku-chan too, didn't you? Taku-chan saying, if it's not me, I don't care who it is. And then you remembered stabbing the woman, which calmed your heartbeat right down. It dispelled your anxiety about stabbing this one, right? The other tapped on the picture, then nodded and pinched the vinyl to distort the baby's face into a grotesque mask. Hurry up. Come over here and join me. Kawashima tried to say, Please don't do this, but his throat was so dry he couldn't speak. Just before the two of them merged, the other said, in a clear and distinct voice. There's only one way to overcome the fear. Kawashima stood in a sort of stupor, like someone receiving a revelation from God. Even after he'd merged with his other self, the voice continued to reverberate inside him. There's only one way to overcome the fear. You've got to stab someone else with an ice pick.